The thing I love most about running a homebrew campaign is how much room we've got creatively to take those big swings. Now, in our game, after our TPK with a brand new party, we hit some dingers, but we also hit some donuts. Those big swings, it can be good, it can be bad. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a play-by-play -play session recap because session recaps are a little bit like dreams. If you weren't there, they weren't interesting. Oh yeah, man, hey, tell us again about all that imaginary stuff that didn't really happen. Nobody cares. Instead, I thought what we could do is take that boring session recap and boil it down until it lifts that fine, sticky juice, those valuable lessons hard-earned through success and failure. These are the six things that I learned in session four and five of my homebrew campaign. Number one, a good idea is not as important as good execution. I love props and I love gimmicks. And when I realized that our campaign was heading towards an investigation of a murder, I was very excited because I had one thing in my mind, one vision, and it was this. That's right, I wanted to do the conspiracy board where they have a cork board and they have NPC portraits, all their suspects, and then red tape, and they can tick tack, tick tack, tick tack, and argue and theorize. I just really wanted to have a very dynamic investigation. But that's not what I ended up with. That was my idea. My execution was very different. You see, I think I left it a little bit too late because instead of giving them that good prop, I had to give them a mediocre prop. I only had time to prepare a blackboard with colored chalk instead of string and some colored cards to write their notes and clues on and lay them out. Now, the players engage with this a little bit because I think probably out of politeness because I, the DM, had made something and given them something. So they said, oh, thanks, and played with it for a bit. But it didn't get the same energy that I wanted because a blackboard isn't the same symbolically as a corkboard and red string. I didn't get that frantic conspiracy energy where they can argue amongst one another and accuse NPCs and come up with harebrained, off-the-wall theories. So my note for my future self is don't half ass it, right? If you're gonna do something, do it right. I've gotta put more effort in in the future. If you feel like leaving a comment downstairs, I would love to hear about your worst Dungeons and Dragons prop. This was mine. Don't hide your levers. Now this is some advice that I might have read on Sly Flourish's blog years ago, probably before I was even dungeon mastering. And what it means is if you have this lever that the party has to pull to advance your story, you need to make it unmissable. Don't accidentally gate your story because of poor planning. Unfortunately for your boy Matty P, I realized too late that I'd messed this up because I'd hidden a crucial diary of the murder victim in a safe behind a painting in the murder room. I had all these clues laid out and the party found the clues in the fireplace. They found the clues around the body. They found the clues on the balcony. They picked up every red herring, but the one crucial piece of information that I needed to contextualize some information for later sessions, they ignored. And instead, my on the fly solution was to have an NPC policeman find it and give it to them because the party was going to leave the room and just completely miss it. So I think my solution to this in the future, instead of hiding my levers, I need to make them unmissable in the sense that I have redundancies. That piece of information that was behind the painting and in the diary, an NPC somewhere in the world should have known it. They might have been able to interrogate a scribe that had written it for the noble that wrote the diary. Or maybe they might have been able to meet a fortune teller somewhere along the line that could give them similar information in a different packaging. So if you don't want to hide your levers, you need more redundancies. This one might be a little bit contentious, but I think it's okay to retcon in Dungeons and Dragons. So a retcon means to, well, ret, retroactively, and con, I don't know what the con part means. So it happens when there's an established fact in a story, but after the fact, later in the story, you go, oh, I want to change that idea, and they just change it. They just pretend it was always the way it was meant to be. For example, in the first two Thor movies, uh, the character of Thor was this very serious and humorless knight. But then in the third movie, Thor Ragnarok, they just transformed him overnight into this jockey goofball. And it was the right decision. And you can do the exact same thing in your D&D games. After the scene has passed, if you have a better idea and it's important to you and you think it's worth it, you can rewind the clock and just change the fact.
For example, we had this moment where the party was trying to get masquerade masks to sneak into a ball hosted by their prime suspect, Slip Nose Schmidt. And Luke's character managed to convince a noblewoman outside the venue to trade masks with him, and he got a great mask for sneaking in. We kept on role playing, we continued on with the heist, but about five minutes later, I realized, oh no, that was a missed opportunity. So I even outright said to the players, do you mind if we rewind the clock a bit and just flesh out that scene a little bit more? And I got Luke to make a perception roll. And with this really high roll, he got to notice that not only was the person, the noblewoman that he bought the mask off blind, but so were some of her companions. And they were all branded on the forearm with a similar arcane symbol. And the players were totally okay with this because it was only in retrospect that I realized this was the perfect opportunity to signpost a faction that I could bring in in a later session. Now this game, it moves real quick and that's why I think it's totally okay to retcon. This one's really important to me and I need to practice it more. Plan problems rather than plan solutions. In this game, I had scaffolding built. I knew the shape of the adventure, but all of the descriptions and all of the real nitty gritty stuff, I just left to improv. In some parts in the session, I think it actually got in the way, particularly in the investigation where you need specific answers to these clues sometimes for it all to be consistent. But there are other times where we ended up with a really organic, reactive story because I didn't know all the answers. For example, when the party finally infiltrated this masquerade ball, they had two plans. They wanted to interrogate the gangster Slipnose Schmidt, and they also wanted to get into his office and steal his ledger, find out who he'd been making bets with. So we had three challenges here. The first was the party was being patrolled by this mean bouncer wearing a championship belt. He was this stocky halfling named The Nug. And the Nug, I told them, he has an eagle eye and he will see through your disguise if you spend too long with him. The second challenge was that if they wanted to get in to talk to Slipno Schmidt, he was actually in the VIP section. So we need to find a way to get in there or be allowed in there. And the third was that the office was locked and trapped. Now, I didn't know exactly how they were gonna solve this thing, but they did solve it and they solved it so perfectly. To their credit, the players have four brains and I've only got one. So I think any solution they come up will be four times as good as my one brain solution. In this case, what they did is the monk went around the back and she tried to break into the office and crack the safe and do all the espionage stuff. And the other two wanted to create a distraction. They wanted to place an outrageous bet that would get the eye of the bookmaker Slipno Schmidt. Hopefully get them into the VIP lounge. Now this left a lot of wiggle room for me to put in all these signposts. I got to be reactive and organic. So when the monk is breaking into the office, they meet the big bad guy, Lincoln Carraway, that this party has never met. He's in a masquerade mask, they have a brief interaction. And Lincoln Carraway's demonic lawyer, Yeetzi, is the person that takes their bet. So they're all friendly, but they don't know it. It also helps that my players are so dramatically minded because when our paladin sees that the monk is in an intense confrontation during their heist bit in the office, he takes that as his cue to go and directly confront the gangster Slipno Schmidt just so that we're elevated tension across the plane. It's really fun. This is something I'd really like to practice and get better at. Planning problems, not solutions. I've just got to practice. Keep your villains alive, even the minor ones. This is kind of a cartoonish trope, right? Like Inspector Gadget, I'll get you next time. I don't know what his bloody voice sounds like. I'll get you next time, Gadget. That's what he says, that's the line. Villains are only as powerful as the shared history they have with the party. And it's hard to establish that history if they keep dying. We had not one, but two fights over these sessions. And the first one was this brawl at the ball. The other was this confrontation with Yeetzi, the demonic lawyer in an abandoned brewery. In the brawl at the ball, I gave the players the option to reflavor all of their attacks as non-lethal attacks. So for example, the monk, when they were throwing their shurikens, which are probably pretty lethal, instead they were throwing trays and pot plants and mugs at people. And the paladin, when they were hitting people with their greatsword, instead of doing an actual slashing damage, they were hitting people with chairs. Now we did it all 
with the same damage, we just reflavored it all, even the magic abilities, it was great. And the players were down with this because it was fun thematically. I was down with it because it meant all the characters get to live and come back and develop later. And I also think the players kind of liked the villains. They liked the Nug, the halfling in the championship belt, and they didn't want to have to kill him. In the second fight against Yeetzee, we had this weird moment where the paladin had sworn his oath of enmity on the demon Yeetzi, who was an ink demon, and the ink demon used their ink demon curse ability uh, to curse Jack's character, the paladin. And so we described it, and I think they both failed, but we described it as the ink blood spraying on his shield, his uh, storied, uh, almost magical shield, uh, and settling into the shape of an arcane demonic rune. And I said, Jack, if you kill Yeetzee, if you land the killing blow, this rune will activate, your shield will quicken and become magical. And from that moment on, when the player is incentivized to kill the villain, that villain has to live because their value increases the longer I can delay that bloody payoff. So I had Yeetzee use greater invisibility and escape the building as it collapsed. Clearly, both the Nug and Yeetzee are useless to me dead. But this way, I can bring them back in later sessions. Yeetzee as a villain to give Jack that shield payoff and the Nug as maybe an ally. Keep your villains alive. And if you've had a villain that's lived a long time, I wanna hear about it. Let me know downstairs in the comments. Be direct. Now this is one of my strengths. Sometimes I see online people asking, how do I communicate this game mechanic like, like it has immunity to this kind of damage? Or how do I get my players to follow this plot point what that I really want them to do? And my advice is just to outright do it. You can say, this is how this works, this is why this happens, or I want you to do this. It's okay. People don't like it because it breaks immersion, but I think there's a lot of utility there. Be direct. After these two sessions, I had a specific trajectory in mind, and I just flat out told the players what it was because they would gleaned some information. They knew that their friend, their murdered friend, was in love, had a secret lover with Melody Wardell, the risen star of Selyun, this holy woman. And he had been murdered by the demonic warlock, Lincoln Carraway, who also planned to marry this woman. So I told the players flat out, guys, there's gonna be a wedding and it's gonna be the marriage of your friend's ex-girlfriend and the person that killed your friend. So there's some revenge to be had, and I would love to have a finale where we break up a wedding, just like the Princess Bride. And before that, I'd like to do a loose session of planning and scheming and plotting. And all the players seemed on board with that. There's gonna be a good payoff. I think I'm actually pretty okay with a loose railroad. <laughs> railroad? <laughs> I think I'm pretty okay with a loose railroad for D&D sessions as a player and as a DM. Maybe we'll do a video about it later. Yeah. Hey Ranger, tell everybody to subscribe to the channel, please. Buddy? Hey, could you could you please say something? Say something like, like and subscribe or whatever. T tell them that I hope they like the video and, and thank you for watching. Ranger? Are you gonna, are you gonna say anything? Buddy? Oh no.